Uh, my name is Igor Latich, as some of you uh, may know me. I, I'm one of the uh, interventional radiology physicians from Yale. Uh, and uh, this morning, we'll be given an overview of, uh, of, of interventional procedures. It, it may seem like a lot. Uh, I, I'll try to keep it as condensed as I can, which means we can't really focus as too much on, uh, on, uh, on details, especially uh, uh, certain therapeutic protocols. If you guys have questions, you can feel free to uh, you know, ask in the end, or you can send me an email um, or reach out any other way. But uh, this is meant to be a, uh, uh, you know, a fairly comprehensive review of all the exciting things that we do, uh, some of the more mundane stuff, and then some of the, uh, the more kind of cutting edge things, especially things that are more dear to me. Uh, so you may ask yourselves, what is interventional radiology? And I still find it difficult to explain to even uh, our colleagues here in the United States who, uh, who deal with us every day. Uh, they may have certain uh, misconceptions or perceptions of what it is that we do <clears throat> without realizing uh, the full scope of, of, uh, of what we have to offer. So in a nutshell, um, IR involves minimally invasive treatment uh, of multiple pathologies using imaging guidance. And there are many different imaging modalities that we can uh, uh, rely on. Uh, many of our colleagues uh, uh, think we, we use magic to, uh, to treat patients. And uh, that can sometimes be uh, 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 quite painful to, uh, to, to, to deal with in the sense that uh, uh, we are often the last resort for some of our patients. Uh, so in many cases, uh, uh, we we get patients who are who have very advanced disease, who are very close to uh, essentially uh, the end, and uh, referring physicians will send them to us for some sort of a, a supernatural magical intervention that only we can provide. Obviously, uh, there's only so much magic to uh, to uh, 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 disperse with, but. Uh, uh, maybe it is a good thing that people uh, uh, think that somehow our procedures have magical effect because for, for a lot of patients, it is truly magical to be able to do a procedure uh, and uh, show barely any physical evidence of it uh, at the skin. Uh, we uh, interact with many, many different services on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, as I was going over these slides last night, I realized that I left out a couple of the ones that uh, even, that I specifically deal with uh, uh, more uh, specifically. But uh, as you can see, and as you probably know, uh, we essentially uh, interact with almost every other service at the hospital, save for perhaps uh, maybe dermatology, although I once had a consult from dermatology about uh, titanium or nickel allergy for one of our filter patients, but that's about it. Uh, we, we deal with uh, the surgical services, medical services, uh, pediatrics, uh, like I said, uh, a whole spectrum of, of cl clinical care. Uh, to get back briefly to uh, who we are, uh, I, you know, I tend to think of ourselves as a, uh, as a medical plumbers, we use body's natural pathways to, uh, to treat diseases, uh, uh, usually vascular pathways, but there are many other pathways and cavities that we uh, enter in order to, uh, 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 to take care of patients. Uh, but most importantly, we are uh, clinicians. We, we are not just uh, a proceduralists, robots with, uh, with needles and fancy uh, imaging. Uh, we are uh, clinicians and we provide, com should strive to provide complete patient care. Uh, but getting back to uh, the more supernatural aspects of our, uh, I suppose, care, you know, maybe we are also medical ninjas. We do uh, 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 make minimal incisions uh, and seek to provide maximum effect. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, after, uh, let's say, uh, even an ablation procedure, which causes uh, uh, quite significant changes internally, if you close up the skin really nicely with some good skin glue, you can barely tell where you entered the body. Uh, and here you are, you provided a, a cancer care, you just destroyed uh, a big chunk of tumor inside somebody's kidney, liver, somewhere else. 
um, yet you can barely tell uh, what you know where the portal was that you used to enter the body. So it is perhaps magic, uh, some of the things that we do. For those of you who might not have decided yet uh, 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 why one would go into IR or how do you explain to patients per perhaps why you should uh, um, undergo a procedure with us. In general, as I said, we make smaller incisions. Our, uh, our approaches tend to be less dramatic, although certainly they can be painful intra-procedurally. That's why it's important, as I always try to remind myself and, and our trainees to, uh, to provide adequate uh, analgesia and when appropriate anesthesia uh, for our patients. Uh, because our approach tends to be less traumatizing, there is less post-procedural pain and shorter recovery. Uh, and as a result, at least in the US, we think that uh, these approaches would be less costly. And I assume elsewhere around the world, that would be the same. Um, although certainly some of our procedures can be quite expensive, primarily on account of some of the uh, equipment that is used. Um, so you may ask yourself, yourselves, what is it uh, that we cannot do uh, in our field? And uh, I would say there's very little that we don't do, at least there are very few organ systems that we are not familiar with or where we don't provide at least one or two uh, procedures. Uh, you know, if you look at this little uh, 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 toy, uh, you can uh, you maybe uh, ask yourself, well, there's nothing over the head, but certainly we do, uh, not myself, but some of our colleagues perform uh, CNS procedures, uh, stroke thrombectomies, uh, AVM treatments, uh, aneurysms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but otherwise we pretty much cover uh, the whole body. Uh, so uh, now to, uh, to just give you a brief overview of uh, specific territories that we're going to cover, uh, I'll try to take us through uh, most, of, most of these, if not all of these, using a certain algorithm uh, we'll discuss the more urgent and emergent kind of procedures, high impact procedures towards the uh, start or the beginning uh, of each of these sections, and then maybe leave some of the uh, the more mundane or less urgent ones uh, uh, uncovered, uh, assuming that we have enough time to, uh, to go through it all. Um, so we'll start with uh, thoracic interventions, and by that I mean anything within the, the chest doesn't have to be just lungs, but above the diaphragm, below the neck, essentially. Uh, so in declining urgency and emergency, we, we do treatments for PE, hemoptysis. Uh, we uh, perform uh, treatment for SVC syndrome, deal with effusions, pneumothoraces, uh, uh, and as a more kind of mundane set of procedures, but really bread and butter, we perform most of the lung biopsies, mediastinal biopsies around the hospital. Um, now, in terms of uh, acute PE treatment, uh, this is really where, uh, where uh, some of the uh, advancements over the last couple of years have made a huge difference uh, uh, clinically in, in patient care. Uh, for uh, you know, decades, we've been able to do primarily pharmacological treatment. So the, the mainstay of uh, PE treatment in patients who are stable uh, is to put them on heparin, systemic heparin, and see how they do. In some of the, uh, the more uh, uh, in patients who are in, in, in more in extremis, so hemodynamically unstable or getting there, uh, there are more invasive methods of, um, of uh, treating their uh, PEs. And certainly one of the methods that uh, became uh, uh, kind of the mainstay of treatment, at least uh, at Yale, and it's probably becoming more widespread, is uh, uh, mechanical suction thrombectomy that we perform uh, using the Inari uh, system that's been around probably for now uh, three to four years. Or so. So, for example, we have this one patient here that has, as you can see, indicated by these nice arrows, these filling defects in the main pulmonary arteries on the left and the right. Uh, and because of impending uh, or uh, ongoing uh, hemodynamic instability, uh, this patient came to us uh, for for treatment. And on the left hand side, you see a, a, a pulmonary angiogram. 
uh, that shows a uh, an enormous filling defect uh, plugging essentially the right uh, main pulmonary artery with some small, you know, filling of some smaller branches in the lower lobe. Um, and after we performed a suction thrombectomy, which is the uh, image on, on the right, you see uh, uh, increased or renewed perfusion to the upper lobe, middle lobe, and the rest of the lower lobe. And bottom image, you see some of these large clots that we have evacuated. So this certainly has become uh, one of the uh, big game changers in, in treatment of PE. And uh, a lot of our patients, a lot, but we certainly have seen an uptick. It's seemingly in uh, uh, incidents of, uh, of acute PE uh, around our hospital system. And we perform these uh, thrombectomies at least on a weekly basis. Uh, in many cases, we do at least a few per week. Uh, so that's been a, a, a huge uh, uh, area where we have been able to provide uh, significant change. Uh, another uh, intervention in the thoracic area uh, that we perform on emergent basis is uh, treatment for hemoptysis. And hemoptysis usually in the U.S. we see in the setting of either a tumor infiltration or radiation changes uh, that cause bronchiectatic uh, uh, destruction uh, within the lung and uh, patients present with uh, hemoptysis. And uh, most often the source of uh, hemoptysis in these patients uh, comes from uh, bronchial arteries and much less frequently from uh, systemic circulation uh, or pulmonary arteries. Uh, now, uh, this is an image of a patient who had uh, radiation treatment uh, uh, done previously who developed bilateral upper lobe uh, bronchiectasis uh, with acute hemoptysis. And uh, th th these are two angiogram images uh, of us performing a bronchial artery uh, angiography uh, initially. As you can see, we have a catheter that came up the uh, aorta and we found one of these uh, uh, bronchial arteries and you see this kind of diffuse uh, tissue staining and some shunting perhaps within the parenchyma. Normally you should see just normal branching, just like any other vascular territory. When you start seeing all these corkscrew uh, vessels and these kind of diffuse tissue stains, you know, there's something abnormal going on. And in this case, we have anatomical correlation on CT. Uh, so we know where to, uh, where to treat. And how do we treat these things? We perform an embolization. I'll briefly go through uh, uh, some of the basics of what embolization uh, involves. So uh, the definition is to occlude a, uh, a vessel, whether it's bleeding, abnormal vessel for any other reason. Uh, in this case, it looks like uh, on this image on the left, it's, a, uh, it's an AVM. Um, so you're occluding a blood vessel because you need to stop the bleeding or some sort of an ongoing acute process that is causing, or even chronic in case of AVMs, uh, that is causing pathology. This occlusion can be permanent. Uh, and I'll briefly go through some of the uh, uh, devices and systems that we have or temporary. And the, uh, the, the bottom line is you try to spare as much normal tissue as you can, right? So you're not gonna take out this whole pulmonary artery here in order to treat that uh, AVM that's uh, in a, one of the uh, segmental branches. So uh, these are some of the embolizing agents and they range in, uh, in cost from probably, you know, maybe a few dollars per pack, which is probably the case with gel foam, which is gelatin sponge, uh, this image on the bottom to you know, probably a few hundred to maybe even a few thousand dollars, which is the case probably with these spindle-shaped devices called amplats or plugs. And you have everything in between. So you go, we have a range of, uh, of embolics that include something that you can inject. So something that can be emulsified into a particle uh, to devices that are more complex structurally uh, uh, that are uh, essentially permanent occlusives such as these plugs. The mainstay of embolization really are these little coils and coils come in a thousand different flavors, maybe not a thousand, but certainly a few dozen. Uh, but certainly those are the, uh, the, the, the mainstay of em uh, embolization uh, uh, worldwide essentially. Um, and 
those coils come also in a variety of, uh, of, of flavors that, uh, uh, you know, some are uh, more thrombogenic, others are less so. Uh, some can be uh, retrieved or some can, some can be partially deployed. And if you're not happy with position, you can retrieve them. Some can't. Uh, so it all depends on uh, what sort of practical circumstances you have at hand. Um, moving on from uh, uh, hemoptysis and kind of a, a brief overview of embolization, we'll talk briefly about SVC syndrome, which is another kind of urgent thoracic pathology that we deal with. SVC syndrome typically in the U.S. and probably worldwide is, uh, is uh, related to having some sort of a uh, mediastinal uh, malignancy or pulmonary malignancy causing uh, uh, partial, or partial or complete obstruction to venous return from the head and the upper extremities. And as you can imagine, that would be related or associated with facial swelling, uh, development of headaches, uh, facial and arm swelling, headaches, dyspnea, chest pain. Um, in many cases where patients can tolerate their symptoms, radiation and chemotherapy are the first line treatments. And certainly in cases of certain lymphomas that respond to uh, radiotherapy, uh, uh, the obstruction may resolve or at least lessen within a few cycles uh, of, of radiation treatment. But in patients that have more longstanding uh, or uh, uh, severe obstruction, we are called upon to intervene. Uh, uh, before I forget, some of the benign causes uh, uh, related or associated with SVC syndrome, certainly that we see are uh, stenoses and obstructions uh, due to indwelling catheters. And in many cases, it's actually not catheters, but pacemaker leads and defibrillator leads, uh, leads uh, that cause uh, kind of chronic narrowing and eventual occlusion of the SVC. Uh, and in this, case, in this case, the patient had a, a lung mass that infiltrated the, uh, the atrium, but also uh, the mediastinum. And you can see that there is barely, there's really no SVC seen. And you see all these white little dots, uh, this uh, filling of vascular structures uh, within the chest wall and pericardium. These are all the collaterals because the SVC is obstructed. So you need collateral flow to uh, uh, provide venous return to the right atrium. And in this case, you see an angiogram. There's a catheter that came up the uh, uh, right upper extremity. We were able to cross the area of, of narrowing and it's, it's, it's markedly irregular. There are probably some obviously uh, clots here now. Uh, there are collaterals, uh, 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 chest wall collaterals, pericardial collaterals, coronary vein collaterals. Uh, and after our magical treatment, which in this case usually involves performing a thrombolysis slash thrombectomy and stent placement, we have provided now inline flow and venous return back to the uh, right atrium. This is commonly associated with almost instantaneous resolution of patient symptoms, or at least within a day or two patients have significant improvement in their symptoms, facial edema, uh, uh, arm swelling, Briefly on lung biopsies, you know, we don't need to go into too much detail, but uh, we perform probably a few hundred to maybe a thousand or so a year uh, at Yale. Uh, you know, they can be pretty straightforward in cases of larger lesions or lesions that are, uh, how do we say, uh, in more favorable locations. Uh, to more challenging ones, and this image on the right perhaps is a little more challenging, though certainly doable, as you can see. There is a, a, a nodule, a mass abutting the uh, essentially pericardium in this uh, area um, and just anterolateral to the uh, aortic arch. Uh, so, um, like I said, some cases can be pretty straightforward. Others are straightforward as long as you take precautions. In this case, you have to make sure to come uh, into the lesion uh, aiming away from the uh, pericardium and the aorta. Uh, you can see this arrow that I've drawn, and you also should pay attention to other things that you can injure in the, pro injure in the process. So you see these two little dots here. That's the, uh, uh, these are the, uh, uh, the internal mammary artery and veins. So you want to make sure not to hit those. We have had a couple of cases where you accidentally injured those, and that can cause hemothorax and all sorts of other problems that you don't want to have to deal with. Uh, 
obviously one of the possible complications of performing a lung biopsy is a pneumothorax, which probably happens in 10% of the cases that we, uh, that we see. Uh, we end up placing chest tubes temporarily, probably in fewer than 5% of patients, but nonetheless, it's something that one should be prepare, prepared for. Um, moving on from, from thoracic interventions to abdominal, and again, we'll follow kind of the same uh, uh, scale of descending urgency. So uh, one of the most emergent procedures that we uh, perform is to uh, uh, treat acute variceal bleeding. Uh, so this is bleeding associated, upper GI bleeding, typically associated with portal hypertension. And is, uh, as you know, first line treatment for this is endoscopy and some sort of uh, sclerotherapy, banding, whatever magic our GI friends can provide. Uh, if that is not sufficient, sufficient, then we are called upon to perform what is called a TIPS procedure, which is, uh, stands for transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. Uh, there are a handful of indications in addition to variceal bleeding uh, for placing a TIPS. Uh, one of them is ascites uh, related to uh, uh, hepatic issues, also hepatic hydrothorax, and in some cases, bud chiari. There are a few relative and maybe one or two absolute contraindications depending on how uh, bad the patient is doing. We have certainly um, maybe in some cases violated our own vows uh, never to do a tips on a patient, you know, with a certain MELD score, for example, but we, uh, we've, you know, all done them in cases where there was really nothing else to do and nothing else to lose in essence. But uh, uh, briefly, a tips, as you can imagine, or as you probably know, involves decompressing the portal system directly into the systemic circulation. And to do that, we go through the jugular vein, find an amenable hepatic vein, and it's usually a right hepatic vein, as illustrated here. And then we uh, run a needle and a catheter eventually into the right portal vein and end up placing a stent uh, of our choice, although there are a, a certain, uh, a couple of, or uh, there's one variety of stents that we most commonly use for this that are uh, covered within the whole uh, portal or hepatic tract and uncovered uh, distally. They're called Viator stents that, they're, that are designed specifically for these purposes. And this shunting provides immediate decompression of the portal sy system and uh, very rapid, uh, uh, hopefully, improvement in uh, patient out uh, outcomes, or at least in a in a variceal bleeding. Sometimes after we place the shunt, we may go after one of the uh, varices that we see, or a network of varices, if necessary. In many cases, once you place the shunt, all these varices decompress. But if they're not fully decompressed, and the patient is still uh, at at uh, risk for bleeding, we may embolize. Uh, the, the varices as well through the shunt. Uh, these are just a couple of angiographic images. As you can see, uh, we've placed the shunt, which is, uh, you know, where this uh, uh, straight uh, conduit is on the right side. And as you see indicated by these arrows, you have all these oops, uh, varices uh, coming off the, uh, uh, the portal vein. And we have placed a bunch of coils there and occluded them. Going from a uh, uh, portal uh, GI bleeding to uh, arterial, uh, which is certainly one of the most common abdominal interventions that we per uh, perform. Most commonly, it's in the lower GI system related to a diverticular disease in the US, uh, closely followed by angiodysplasia. Uh, obviously, endoscopy, again, has essentially first dibs on these patients unless the patient is bleeding so massively that it would be difficult for them to visualize anything on account of uh, a significant amount of blood in the uh, intestine. Uh, there is certainly a role for uh, tagged nuclear studies. They are much more sensitive to a, a bleeding, acute bleeding than a, a, a angiography, probably on a scale of 10. Um, which can be problematic for us sometimes because we may have a patient that has a positive tagged a uh, red blood cell scan, but they come to us and their uh, angiogram is negative. That's usually because maybe their bleeding might have stopped in the meantime, but sometimes also related to the fact that tagged red cell scans are more sensitive to a small volume 
bleeding. So what we typically do at Yale now is we actually do uh, CT uh, angiograms of the mesenteric vasculature. Those have about the same sensitivity parameters as uh, angiography. So if a patient, and it takes much less time to do a CTA. So if the patient has a positive CTA, we just bring them straight to IR uh, for embolization. This also helps because it gives us a clear idea of where the bleeding is coming from, so we waste less looking around. Uh, this is an example of an upper GI bleeding in a patient that has gastritis. Uh, and as you can see in these images on the right, you see this fuse mucosal staining uh, uh, after we have selectively injected the left gastric artery. And uh, uh, here, uh, one of the uh, kind of mainstays of treatment is to do a, a gel foam embolization. So we inject uh, emulsified uh, gelatin sponge particles, and that causes essentially immediate cessation of uh, flow. This is an example of lower GI bleeding in a patient with diverticular disease, uh, as indicated by these arrows. See, we have uh, uh, accessed uh, a, a small uh, branch seemingly arising from the uh, this looks like it's off the SMA, maybe iliocolic branch. And uh, uh, this is after we have uh, performed an embolization. In this case, it, we might have used a glue. Typically, we will use coils here if we can get very selective. If we cannot get uh, uh, very terribly selective, we may inject um, other permanent embolics, uh, either cyanoacrylate glue in some cases or PVA particles. Uh, whatever the operator might be comfortable with. You just have to be very, very careful here because if you cause uh, too much non-target embolization, you can cause ischemia and the patient will end up uh, uh, with a dead bowel, which requires surgery. Then like embolization, we most commonly perform in the setting of trauma, blunt trauma, can be penetrating trauma too. Uh, in many cases, we would not see a, a discrete abnormality, especially with blunt trauma. You just kind of see this you know, almost like a brain contusion, just uh, uh, kind of diffuse tissue staining throughout the uh, spleen. Uh, the mainstay of treatment for that is to deploy one of these devices, or at least where you have them available, an embolization, occlusion device, an amplexer plug. We put it in the mid splenic artery, as you can see here. Um, Hold on a second. Uh, I can't see my cursor anymore. So anyway, uh, and uh, the idea with that is that you don't really... Am I completely frozen? Yeah, I think your, your screen is not advancing. Maybe stop sharing and then reshare. because it's still on the acute GI bleeding screen. Yep, yep, uh, just that my, did the, did the image forward the slide? No, no, the slide is stuck on the acute GI bleeding. It's still stuck? Yeah. For some, oh, give me a second. Um, I don't know if it's a Zoom issue or my keyboard issue. I just disconnected my surface from the, um, uh, the keyboard from the surface to see if that'll do it. See, I can move it manually on my screen and I can't even stop share for some reason. Um, I don't know why. That, it's interesting, you can hear me. So Zoom is, although my image on Zoom is frozen, uh, but I can't. Give me a second. Yeah, maybe, maybe you have to just log on, uh, log off and log back on. No, I know I'm trying, I can't even exit, escape the, uh, <laughs> uh, the image. Uh, this is what I'll do. Let me just shut down for a second. And I have to shut it down. Unfortunately, there's no way. Okay. I can't even, uh, I can't get out of the screen. Give me a second. 
Can you hear me again? Yes. Yeah, I don't know what mm -hmm. was here with that. It was just frozen in time and space. See if it works now. Okay, I'm just bringing up my uh, PPT. Second, I gotta where's my screen share? Screen share. Okay. <clears throat> can we can you hear me now? Yeah. And we can okay. So, uh, sorry about that. So, Upper G, is this where we stopped or was it a... The, the, yeah, the last slide that we could see was this one. This yeah. one, okay. So, Upper GI bleeding briefly. So, this is a left gastric uh, angiogram patient that had an Upper GI bleeding, probably secondary to gastritis. As you can see, there is this diffuse mucal staining on a selective uh, ga left gastric angiogram. And here we perform particle embolization, typically with gel foam. You don't want to use something uh, permanently occlusive, unless you really have to, uh, because we're not getting terribly selective here. We're injecting uh, uh, embolic directly into the main trunk of the left gastric artery. So you want to inject something that will temporarily kind of slow down the flow of blood through the area and uh, uh, cause uh, cessation. This is an example of a lower GI bleeding in a patient that has probably a diverticular disease and the uh, ascending colon. As you can see, there's a focus of active extravasation coming from a branch of the iliocolic artery, so uh, off the SMA, which we have uh, embolized with particles in this case, although I will say most commonly this embolization is performed with uh, uh, coils if we can get very selective, which means if we can get into one of these vasorecta supplying the intestine. If we can't, sometimes you can inject very gingerly a small amount of uh, embolic material. Sometimes patient, uh, people will use cyanoacrylate glue. Others may use uh, uh, PVA particles. It's operator dependent, um, but you have to be really, really careful about non-target embolization because you can cause ischemia in this case. Uh, we also perform a decent number of splenic embolizations. This is typically done for blunt trauma uh, where in many cases, you don't see a focus uh, or a focal uh, uh, abnormality, pseudoaneurysm or, focal, or, or focus of extravasation. You see kind of diffuse abnormality in the spleen. And we typically will call it place a, you know, a, 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 a nest of coils or one of these amplets or devices, occlusion devices into the mid splenic artery. And the idea here is not to cause complete cessation of flow into the spleen. Uh, because that would cause infarction, but to decrease the uh, pressure head uh, enough to uh, allow body's natural coagulation pathways to take over for, for the, uh, the damage to get repaired and for, uh, for the patient to stop bleeding. Um, another fairly emergent procedure that we do uh, is a placement of uh, cholecystostomy tubes for acute cholecystitis. Now, standard of care, obviously, is cholecystectomy in those patients who are uh, surgical candidates, but certainly at our institution, we perform at least a few hundred percutaneous cholecystostomies a year, uh, which is meant to be a temporizing measure uh, until the patient can be, uh, the gallbladder can be removed. However, we have so many patients that will never become surgical candidates because they're just too old, too sick, have many other things going on, and we place catheters uh, percutaneously usually going through a small hepatic tract directly into the gallbladder um, that decompresses them acutely. Patients get better, they go home, they can typically come back then. In a couple of weeks, we'll inject the, the tube, see uh, if there are any stones, if the cystic duct is open, 
if the patient had a calculus cholecystitis because they were just sick and hospitalized for a long time, they have no stones. Uh, when you check the tube, everything looks patent. You can remove the catheter. Uh, that said, the catheter typically, once you place it, has to stay in for at least three to four weeks for a, a little tract, fibrin tract, to develop. So when you pull the catheter out, that you don't get spillage of contract or uh, bile all over the peritoneum. Uh, some patients uh, that have calculus cholecystitis that are not surgical candidates, say they have a stone like that, we may actually do uh, at our institution endoscopic laser cholelithotripsy. So we we fragment the stones, pull them out, and then eventually we uh, remove the uh, 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 the catheter out of them. Uh, the next uh, uh, area of uh, uh, abdominal intervention where we make a big difference is biliary obstruction. First line of treatment for biliary obstruction is obviously ERCP uh, or endoscopy. In patients who are not endoscopic candidates because again, maybe they're too sick or they had bypasses performed, uh, uh, Ruin Y, for example, bypasses, uh, or that have high obstructing lesions such as Klatskin tumors, uh, we place uh, transhepatic biliary drains to decompress uh, the biliary system. Uh, this is an example of uh, one such patient who had actually multiple drains placed. Uh, and you see just how dilated this uh, uh, the, the, the intrahepatic biliary tree is. Uh, I mean, these ducts are abnormally uh, enlarged. Uh, Another uh, intervention similar to biliary decompression, I suppose, just in a different organ system is uh, uh, urinary uh, decompression. So patients that have urinary obstruction because of stones, because of cancers, uh, any other reason. Uh, the first line treatment again is endoscopy. And by that, we mean uh, endoscopy by our urology friends who do a retrograde uh, uh, approach transistic and they try to place a stent. If they can't get up um, through the, uh, the bladder, then we go anti-grade through the kidney and down towards the bladder. Uh, and uh, I would say that at Yale, we probably perform at least a few hundred uh, fresh uh, nephrostomy placements uh, per year. Uh, most cases we place these for some sort of malignant obstruction but we certainly place them also temporarily in patients who have stones that require uh, nephrolithotomies. Uh, so we place access and then our urology friends take the patient to the OR and they perform a, a endoscopic uh, stone uh, extraction and, and lithotripsy, or not lithotripsy, but lithotomy. Um, this is just an example of, a, of, an, of access through a lower pole calyx and this patient actually had surgical anatomy. So there is a ileal conduit on the bottom, as you can see a little clip uh, where they uh, perform their anastomosis and the patient developed a stricture there. That's why the uh, collecting system uh, became obstructed. So we were able to cross that obstruction and provide uh, a nephroureteral catheter. Uh, just briefly, um, uh, we perform uh, probably a few thousand abscess drainage procedures a year at Yale. And this is really the, the bread and butter of what IR can do around the world. Uh, you can use whatever modality you like for imaging guidance. I personally like ultrasound because it gives you that real time feedback. In some cases, you can't see things with ultrasound because they're too deep or adjacent to bowel. So you may use CT. Uh, most commonly, we uh, place uh, abscess drains for surgical infections or post-surgical infections. Also patients who have diverticular abscesses, appendiceal abscess, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease in some cases, uh, without bothering you or boring you too much with details of kind of basic approaches. This is one of the more, I suppose, challenging, exciting approaches, however you like to see it. A uh, patient that has a pelvic abscess uh, where we perform transgluteal drainage and to do a effective and safe transgluteal drainage, you really have to stay as close as you can to the sacrum with your approach. Uh, and you have to avoid some of the uh, neurovascular structures that are that tend to be more anterior, which are various branches of the uh, obturator vasculature, uh, uh, sciatic, uh, pudendals, etc. So you stay close to the sacrum and also try and not hit the, uh, the rectum.
and uh, this provides very effective uh, drainage pathway for patients that have deep pelvic abscesses. Liver cancer treatment, obviously this is kind of the, uh, uh, the exciting uh, uh, oncology work that uh, almost everyone in IR dabbles in. Uh, it's a little beyond the scope uh, of this talk to go into too much detail, and I'm sure that you will have other speakers to, uh, to go into more detail uh, on this but you have a whole spectrum of chemoembolization procedures that we can perform, radioembolization procedures that we can perform. Uh, and uh, we do this as part of multidisciplinary teams uh, with our friends from hepatology, transplant, surgery, and others who are involved, each of which have a, a role uh, to play. And patients are triaged appropriately and if found to be appropriate candidates for uh, uh, local treatment or regional treatments, they are sent to us. This is just an example of uh, one of the angiograms uh, uh, of a patient undergoing uh, TACE, where you see these uh, uh, discrete tumor blushes throughout the hepatic parenchyma related to what's known HCC. And we, after we performed uh, chemoembolization uh, with your choice of uh, particles, uh, you, uh, you cause this kind of uh, diffuse distal pruning of the vasculature and you no longer see the other tumors. Uh, uh, in the same vein of, uh, of uh, uh, interventional oncology, we do treatments for renal cell uh, carcinoma. There are multiple uh, treatment options for patients from partial nephrectomies to uh, radical nephrectomies to ablations in patients in whom we perform ablations. Uh, uh, we, uh, we have also uh, a spectrum of modalities that we use. Traditionally, most uh, operators like to use cryoablation, but certainly you can use microwave or radio frequency, whatever you're comfortable with or whatever you uh, prefer. This is an example of cryoablation of this little uh, uh, partially exophytic lesion in the upper pole of the right kidney, uh, where we place a probe percutaneously. And as you can see an image on the right, you see this little hypoechoic halo developing around the tip of the needle. That's the, uh, the uh, growing ice ball. Uh, and uh, there are certain parameters that are, again, beyond the scope, scope of this talk uh, that you follow to, uh, to achieve appropriate uh, uh, coverage of that lesion. Uh, and uh, uh, lastly, uh, uh, one of the less urgent procedures that we perform uh, in, in, in the abdominal world is placement of gastrostomy and gastrojejunostomy tubes. It doesn't mean that we don't do these often. We do them almost daily. Uh, this is for patients that have uh, difficulty eating, dysphagia for whatever reason. Uh, these are also placed by surgery and endoscopy or GI, uh, but certainly at our institution, we perform most of these. Uh, and we certainly have hundreds of patients who come to us for maintenance of these uh, catheters. Uh, for cutaneous biopsy, we don't need to go into too much detail, similar as biopsies elsewhere in the body. Just one uh, little uh, note for liver biopsies, you can target bi uh, lesions. If patients have discrete lesions within the liver, you can do parenchymal biopsies for diffuse liver diseases. Say patients has hepatitis, some sort of cirrhosis, you want to figure out exactly what's going on. Uh, you may do a parenchymal biopsy, which is... Uh, uh, you know, target a specific lesion, you just put a uh, needle into the liver somewhere and take a couple of samples. Uh, pelvic interventions, maybe in the interest of time, we'll just go quickly through them. Again, in the sense of in the, uh, 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 in the uh, order of descending urgency, uh, you have uh, procedures that are done for pelvic related to trauma or postpartum uh, patients who have uh, uh, painful or bleeding uterine fibroids, patients that have uh, a benign uh, prostatic hypertrophy and either have difficulty urinate, uh, with urination, they may have uh, hematuria as a, result of the, as a result of that. So one of the exciting procedures that we perform is prostatic artery embolization. Uh, this is an example of pelvic embolization from trauma. You see there's a patient that has a huge pseudoaneurysm uh, coming off of one of the branches, it looks like it's maybe the uh, uh, superior or inferior gluteal, which we have coiled off successfully. Uh, patients that have symptomatic uterine fibroids, and certainly, uh, at least in the uh, uh, developing world, there's a, there's a large role for this in patients who uh, uh, would otherwise uh, want to be spared from surgical intervention. Uh, these are 
uh, can be performed on the same day ambulatory basis. Uh, uh, and there is certainly robust evidence that these are highly effective procedures uh, and uh, cause significant improvement in quality of life and, and patient uh, symptoms. Uh, this is an example of an MRI of a patient that has a, a large uh, uh, uterine myoma, and uh, uh, this is an angiogram. Uh, one quick note with these is uh, we always, almost always, whenever possible, perform bilateral uterine artery embolization because there's a lot of collateralization from one side to the other, and invariably these uh, uh, fibroids will recruit vascular supply from both sides. In some cases, they will even recruit vascular supply from ovarian arteries, which you may have to uh, then subselect uh, to, uh, to, to probe and potentially embolize. Varicocele uh, is a uh, uh, painful enlargement of the uh, uh, gonadal vein in the papiniform plexus, basically in the, in the testicle. So uh, there is endovascular treatment, which we provide, and there's surgical treatment by our friends from uh, urology. Uh, efficacy is about the same in both cases. Most commonly, these are left-sided. So we, uh, uh, we cannulate the uh, uh, femoral vein, come up the IVC, find the left renal vein, and then through the left renal vein, access the gonadal vein, and eventually pack it with coils, and we inject a sclerosin, a sclerosin solution called Sotradecol uh, to cause, uh, uh, to, per to perform embolization of these, and that, that causes, uh, uh, obviously, immediate cessation of, of flow and uh, improvement in symptoms in these patients. Uh, briefly, uh, uh, Peripheral vascular interventions used to be the mainstay of uh, kind of uh, the bread and butter of IR. Now a lot of other or a few other services provide um, these procedures, and specifically at Yale, our friends in cardiology have taken on quite a bit of this uh, workload. But again, in, in a, a descending urgency, you have patients that have not just claudication, but that have uh, a critical limb ischemia in which we per perform revascularization patients who have chronic venous insufficiency, patients with DVTs, uh, and then there is the uh, uh, renal failure patients with, in, in whom we uh, uh, implant all sorts of dialysis catheters, maintain their fistulas and grafts, or place our own uh, fistulas. Um, we don't have too much time to go through details of this, but peripheral arterial disease, as you, as you probably know, fairly straightforward. This is, uh, you know, where our work as plumbers really excels. You know, you, you find your area of obstruction and then you treat it however you, uh, uh, what, uh, with whatever means are most appropriate. Uh, oftentimes you perform angioplasty. In cases where angioplasty doesn't work, you may angioplasty and place a stent. Uh, this is an example of kissing stents in a bilateral common iliac arteries for pa a patient that had uh, severe narrowing of uh, uh, the ostea, both common iliac arteries, and we place these stents that touch within the aorta, that's the term kissing stents, and you see the uh, uh, marked improvement in appearance on that right-hand image. Chronic ve venous insufficiency, uh, I'll just go briefly through uh, actually a treatment of DVT, uh, because this has become a very important part of our daily repertoire. Um, we have a lot of patients who are immobile for many reasons, uh, post-surgical, obesity-related, cancer-related. Um, patients develop deep venous thrombosis. In most cases, they can be anticoagulated. Uh, it tends to work quite well if they have symptomatic iliofemoral uh, thrombosis or thrombosis extending into the IVC. Uh, we may be called upon to perform catheter-based procedures. Typically, these involve thrombolysis, meaning uh, dissolving clot using uh, catheters. Uh, in this case, you see a patient that had uh, common uh, iliac and IVC occlusion with all these uh, uh, paralumbar paravertebral collaterals. And after a few days of uh, thrombolysis, uh, we were able to eventually revascularize uh, the uh, iliacs and the IVC. These days, we may uh, perform this in a single uh, session using our thrombectomy system, the same system essentially that is used or similar that is used for P thrombectomies. Uh, 
uh, where we try to suck out as much of the uh, acute and chronic clot, kind of uh, suck it out and scoop it out, and then place stents for more long-term patency. Uh, chronic renal insufficiency, just briefly, uh, uh, this obviously uh, it involves us getting involved in uh, maintaining patency of various arteriovenous dialysis fistulas and grafts in patients or placing devices. These devices typically are a tunneled and non-tunneled hemodialysis catheters. There are many different flavors of other central venous catheters that are placed for antibiotic delivery, medication delivery, delivery resuscitation. We don't have too much time to get into that. Uh, IVC filters used to be exciting, a little less so exciting now, but one of the devices that we place to uh, uh, minimize passage of, of emboli uh, in patients that are at risk or that have high uh, uh, thrombus burdens, uh, these can be removed once the patient is successfully anticoagulated and uh, not in extremis anymore. Briefly, neurointerventions. I don't perform them, but many of our colleagues do stroke interventions uh, in patients who have uh, 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 typically ischemic stroke. Uh, you can treat carotid stenosis, placing stents, but there's also bread and butter kind of uh, pain management that is involved uh, in, in this uh, kind of organ system where we do celiac plexus blocks, pain injection injections, whether they be epidural injections, facet injections, uh, we can do uh, vertebral augmentations, which is what I do, spinal tumor, uh, thermal ablations, et cetera. So this is an example of a vertebroplasty in a patient with uh, osteoporotic compression of a vertebral body where we percutaneously uh, inject cement into the compressed vertebral body. In some cases, some operators may choose to uh, use little balloons to uh, uh, increase uh, vertebral body height um, and create more space for cement. Some people don't do that. Um, and uh, treatment is almost immediate pain relief. It's, uh, it's quite remarkable in, a, in, a, in how well some patients respond. Uh, MSK interventions, briefly, this is kind of a nascent field. This is what I uh, like to do in my spare time. Uh, uh, we do uh, treatments uh, for uh, uh, primary or metastatic uh, musculoskeletal uh, lesions. We use, do tumor ablations. We also do a complex uh, stabilization procedures with our friends from orthopedics, where we uh, inject, uh, uh, where we do percutaneous ablation. We place these big cannulated screws into these big lesions. We uh, perform radiofrequency ablation, but you can do any other thermal ablation. We then uh, do osteoplasty, inject cement, and then through that, uh, we place, uh, we drill the screws all the way in, so we provide structural support and and cancer uh, treatment all in one session and the patient goes home the same day. Uh, this is a patient that had a metastasis in his calcaneus. This is our first patient that we did use in this approach where we placed a screw and ablated and cemented and it worked very nicely and the patient felt uh, significantly improved after. Um, this is an example of a uh, massive uh, cryoablation of a large uh, soft tissue sarcoma uh, in, in this patient where I placed uh, almost more, I think it was more than a dozen of these cryoprobes. So uh, uh, really this was meant to be more as a, uh, just a little teaser to show you uh, uh, kind of what are some of the bread and butter, but also some of the more exciting and cutting edge procedures that we do. Uh, where do we go from here? Who knows? Uh, it's upon you to, uh, to uh, take our field uh, to the next uh, level. Uh, we really uh, are only limited by our, own, our, uh, our uh, own imagination. You have the tool set uh, that can be translated from, as you can see, one organ system to the next. It's all about being able to apply it responsibly uh, and uh, effectively and sometimes uh, uh, you know, creatively in, in whichever ways you find to be appropriate and necessary for the treatment of your patients. That's about it. I'm sorry about all the technical glitches. I hope that you had a uh, uh, decent time listening to me. Uh, I can take questions now or uh, offline, depending on what the uh, what your preference might be.